At the UPS Store, we know things can get busy this upcoming holiday. You can count on us to be open and ready to help with any packing and shipping or anything else you might need. Is there anything you can't do? Um, actually, I don't have a good singing voice. <clears throat> the UPS... Nope. But our certified packing experts can pack and ship just about anything. At least that's good. The UPS Store. Be unstoppable. Most locations are independently owned. Product, services, pricing, and hours of operation may vary. See center for details. Come in today to get your holiday goodies there on time. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who feels safe in a cage in New York City. Here is the captain. Yeah, come inside the cage and let's cuddle. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are sipping on some Hamilton Pale by the good folks at Family Business Beer Company located just outside of Austin, Texas. Hamilton Pale is an American Pale Ale, an APA for you acronym fans. Hamilton Pale is bright, hoppy, and crisp with a little apricot, peach, and some tropical citrus that provides a lot of juicy flavor with just the right amount of bitterness. Garage Grade 4 out of five bottle caps. And how about some thanks and praise to our good garage friends. First up, a long distance cheers to Ivana in Trieste, Italy. And a big We Like to Jib goes out to Jen from Queens, New York. And last but certainly not least, we have a cheers to Whitney Bach listening in her garage in Lincoln, Nebraska. Everyone we just mentioned helped us to fill up the old garage fridge this week. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, B-W-E-W-R-U-N, Beer Run. If you need more True Crime Garage for your earballs, and you know you do, and you're listening right now on the Apple Podcast app, then just hit subscribe. You can also subscribe to us on Patreon as well. So go do that now. Keep the lights on, my friends. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Police make an arrest after a human torso and foot were found inside a building in the Bronx. The suspect has been identified as Sheldon Johnson, a criminal justice activist who previously served time in prison. All right, Fox 5's Linda Schmidt live in the high bridge section of the Bronx tonight with more on this surprising turn of events. Linda. Yes, yeah, certainly surprising. Well, first of all, this guy said he had turned his life around after spending most of his adult life in prison. In fact, just last year, he started working with the Queen's Public Defender's Office. Well, now he is accused of shooting a man in the head in the apartment building right here behind me and then dismembering his body. 48-year-old Sheldon Johnson of Harlem is charged with murder and concealment of a human corpse. This is Johnson recently on Joe Rogan's podcast, talking about how he had turned his life around after a life of crime. He was working with troubled youth with the Queen's Public Defender's Office. The shirt he is wearing says Queen's Defenders. I got into school. I got my GED. Um, from there, I got involved in um, correspondence courses. I started interacting with guys who were teaching ART, aggression replacement training, and I started to begin to understand how these concepts work, what positive visualization is, um, deep breathing, how to remove yourself, conflict resolution. Well, police say Johnson's life of crime apparently was not over. He is accused of shooting 44-year-old Colin Small in the head in Small's sixth-floor apartment on Summit Avenue and then dismembering his body. 
Detectives combing over potential evidence again today. Inside the apartment in the high bridge section of the Bronx, a law enforcement source telling me they found a man's torso and foot in a plastic storage bin. Investigators also found the victim's head, legs, and arms in Johnson's freezer in his apartment building in Harlem. The superintendent of the victim's apartment building saying a neighbor heard gunshots and surveillance video tells the story. The tenant of the apartment, he came in, he never came out. So I called police because it's suspicious. The super providing me with these surveillance pictures inside the building that allegedly show Johnson carrying bags in and out of the apartment building the day of the murder and changing his clothes several times, as well as wearing disguises. Now today I also reached out to the Queens Public Defender's Office where Sheldon Johnson had been working, but they had no comment. Back inside to you. That clip there is very recent news. It's a clip from Fox News 5 out of New York. And here is your headline. This is from the folks over at the Daily News, New York's hometown newspaper. The headline reads, From jail to anti-violence leader to busted in torso slay. Freed after 25 years, he becomes advocate but now faces rap and gruesome dismemberment. That's the crazy headline. They are talking about 48-year-old Sheldon Johnson Jr., a man who goes to prison and is there for roughly 25 years due to his repeated violent behavior and crimes. He gets out, and then less than one year later, according to New York courts, is charged with murder. Well, Sheldon is arrested for murder and dismembering the corpse. When he's arrested, he is photographed by the media, his hands cuffed, arms behind him. He's being held by detectives wearing a suit and tie, one on each side of Sheldon Johnson. And he's wearing one of those hazmat looking suits, no face covering, but a white hazmat type suit. I believe this one is a Tyvek brand suit with a hood and he has on his eyeglasses. This whole story is shocking to a lot of people, of course, due to the nature of the crimes. But we're also talking about this because this dude was thought to be a champion of rehabilitation, the poster child for reformed convicts, who very briefly became a community leader. Now, before we get too far into the weeds here, Captain, I'd like to say that the reporting on this story is a little difficult. We should point out that there are that we're getting varying accounts of some of the details here from the different news outlets. Now, this is not because of anyone doing a poor job. The story is just very, very new. The news teams are attempting to get the information correct. But as we know, the police are going to be holding on to information here like we would expect. Johnson has been charged with killing another man in a New York City apartment, chopping him up, and leaving his head in a freezer. Dismemberment has become a new theme on this show. Unfortunately, and I'm hoping it's a theme that we can move on from at some point. But Yeah, maybe next week we could do a missing person case. The, the stories keep finding themselves to us, finding their way to us. And this one was so startling in the news that we we had to discuss it here in the garage. It's because it... it the unique nature of this story. Yeah. And the short of it is that Sheldon Johnson Jr., age 48, he's a former felon who got out of prison less than one year ago. He is also a prominent criminal justice reform advocate. Just last month, in February of 2024, Sheldon Johnson was a guest on the Joe Rogan podcast. He was interviewed extensively, mainly for Joe and Sheldon to wax poetic, discussing how screwed up the justice and prison systems are. Sheldon was working with the Queens Defenders legal group in New York before the arrest. The NYPD is now accusing Johnson of shooting 44-year-old Colin Small in Colin's Bronx apartment. 
I'm going to read for you, Captain, a an article that provides a little more detail here. So this is from the folks over at CNN. And it says, police were called to Small's apartment. That's Colin Small, the victim here. After neighbors overheard gunshots coming from inside, this is just from less than two weeks ago. Neighbors heard two gunshots and then two more shots, the source said. Police told CNN that when officers arrived, they found an unidentified human torso at the apartment. The office of the chief medical examiner will determine the cause of death, according to the NYPD. Sheldon Johnson was at Colin Small's apartment when officers arrived. Okay, so let's fill in the blanks here and paint this picture a little more Bob Ross-like. Let's be thorough. Right. Please do paint a couple happy trees. The way that this story is being told in the news, and from my understanding, while it seems like we're laying out facts, yes, these are the facts of the case. I do think that there is still some mystery here in this case and in this story that I, I'm hoping that we'll get all of those all of the blanks will be filled in as this thing makes its way through the court system. Right. But the way that this is being reported is that neighbors heard some gunshots. Then they hear someone like pleading for their life and then they hear two more gunshots. So to be clear, two gunshots, someone pleading for their life, a man's voice saying something to the effect of, please don't, I have family, and then you hear two more gunshots. Now, what was the first <laughs> The first thing along the long road of surprising things in this story is those neighbors reportedly called the super, the superintendent of the building. Yeah, don't do that. Call 911. Yes, I, and, and I, I do wish that those persons were here for to tell us why they chose to, I'm sure that there's some reasoning involved in why they chose to take that action, but right. let's not fault them. They took action instead of doing nothing, instead of fleeing, instead of turning away or going, Oh, that's probably nothing. They at least called somebody notified somebody. Yeah. They heard something. They said something for all we know. They called the superintendent and say, I think you should call 911. Now the cool thing is the superintendent has the ability to grant access to the apartment to law enforcement. So in a sense, they're, they're, they're helping to provide that step right, right away. Police don't have to show up and ask people what, what's going on. What's going on. Oh, we can't get into the apartment. We got to get a hold of the super. So the superintendent calls nine one one police show up on the scene. They're given access to the apartment. Now I want to say here, Sheldon Johnson has said he's innocent of these charges, and we'll get into the charges here in a minute. The problem for Sheldon Johnson is that when police arrive at the apartment, Sheldon Johnson is in the apartment. The person who is living at the apartment, Colin Small, is dead. They find him dismembered with Sheldon Johnson in the apartment. Definition of caught red-handed. This definition is going to get going to get. It's like uh, you have a burrito and you have a burrito supreme. This is red handed supreme, buddy. I I don't even know how this guy could say he's innocent. But look, he's, he's a piece of shit. We've said this plenty of times here in the garage. One one problem you have with career criminals, a person who who spends their lifetime committing crimes and reoffending, reoffending, reoffending. Most of the time, those types, the way that they're brought up and the way that they conduct their activities, their offenses, and their lifestyle is never admit to anything. Because the rest of the population, some of them will break down and admit to something. Some of them, their conscience will get the best of them and they will, they will admit to something. And for the most part, you can never take that back. Right. You're going to be sitting in court one day. You're going to have appeals. You're going to be sitting in a jail cell, prison cell one day. You can never take that back because anytime you have an argument for your innocence or a plea for leniency, there's always the argument on the other side where they, they immediately go, but you told us you did it. 
You said that you did it. Well, if you're Jesse Miss Kelly, you can confess and recant at least six times. Yes. You could you could certainly do that. I would I would wager Franklin here that uh Sheldon Johnson, while he's certainly not my favorite person in the world, I would wager Franklin that he would be able to beat Jesse Miss Kelly ten times out of ten in a game of tic tac toe. <laughs> So that's the problem with Jesse Miss Kelly's uh, confession. So when police Sorry. arrive on the scene, they find the person that they are later going to charge with the murder in the residence, in the home, in the apartment of the person that they believe that the suspect killed, Colin Small. Yeah. When they show up, they say, we've all seen Law and Order. We know how this plays out, right? Police show up. They go, hey, who are you? Are you the, are, do you live here? No, I don't live here. And then the super standing behind him going, yeah, that's not, uh, that's not Colin small. I don't know who that man is. And then Sheldon Johnson tells the police, oh no, Colin small. I know Colin. I'm, I'm here for reason a or reason B. Maybe he's says he's collecting the mail or, or doing right. something, but he tells the police Colin's not here. He's upstate New York right now. Okay. Well, inside the apartment with the person that they're later going to charge with the murder, they find one of those, those totes. One, uh, it's a blue bin with the, it's like a rectangle shape with the lid. Right. Right. Picture a giant, a giant piece of Tupperware. They open this thing up. They take the lid off. Oh God. Inside they find a torso. That's the unidentified torso. Of course, immediately they're going to think they're going to just, using the old eyeballs, they're going to look at it and go, that appears to be an adult male black torso. The person that's missing from the apartment that lives here is an adult African-American male. So of course he's arrested. Now, one part, the reason why I went into the description of the picture that we see when he is being cuffed and being walked out by detectives, he's being walked out. That's not from the apartment building. This is after he's been questioned, read his rights, and they went through all the formalities that you need to go through. As said, he doesn't admit to anything. I imagine that when he has to be wearing that hazmat type type suit when the police walk into the apartment, right? That, that's a little bit of a red flag. Yeah, not good. right. You don't usually find somebody just standing in an apartment wearing a hazmat suit all by their lonesome. Now, doesn't law enforcement find other body parts? Yeah, so th this is where the reporting's a little tricky because, right. and it's not really important what, there's no, again, I these stories I do not like telling for the sake that it's, there's no comfortable way for me to say these words and these sentences. You're just going to have to say it. I have to say it. Say it. We have Colin Small, who's living in an, in the Bronx. We have Sheldon Johnson, the suspect, who's living in Harlem. They both have their, you know, individual apartments and the torso and some other parts are reported as being found in Colin Small's apartment in that bin, in that, that blue Tupperware type large bin. But then the other part that's going to make this very difficult for Sheldon Johnson to be found innocent by any jurors anywhere is that they found other parts of the victim at Sheldon Johnson's apartment in Harlem. It's been reported and, and I don't want to get into all the, the different reporting here, but what seems to be consistent captain is that the torso of our victims found in the victim's apartment and the head of the victim is found in the apartment of the suspect. Yeah. So let's think about this for a second. Please show up. Hey, where's the guy we're looking for? Not here. Oh, well, his torso is here and you're here. Oh, you know nothing about this? Well, let's go check out your apartment. Oh, we find more body parts. You don't know what happened. You don't know how these body parts has ended up in your apartment. You don't know well, how the victim's head showed up, showed up in your apartment. I mean, some of the reports were saying that the victim's head was found in a freezer. The icing on the cake is he's wearing this weird Tyvek hazmat type suit. 
he's carrying a gun when he's arrested. Right. So do you think his thought was that I'm going to take these body parts and, and put them in these, this Tupperware and then I'm going to walk out with a hazmat suit. Like to me, the hazmat suit, maybe they're not going to be able to see your face. Maybe they're not going to be able to identify you, but people are going to know you're going to draw a lot of attention to yourself wearing that stupid suit. I think the suit, he was only wearing it while he's in the apartment to handle and package everything up. Right. To say it politely, because clearly what he appears to be doing to me, he's making this large package smaller and he's slowly Johnny cash one piece at a time, removing it from victim's apartment, returning to his apartment. And then my guess is from there, he would slowly, his next move is probably to slowly discard these items somehow some manner pr- throughout the city probably drive around throughout the city tossing them in random dumpsters unfortunately what sheldon johnson is not is dumb but also unfortunately what sheldon johnson is is evil and he's smart enough that i think he thought i'm going to make this guy disappear right and then there's no if, if he disappears there's no body there's no murder there's no suspect. They will they will likely only investigate this so far if they hit the roadblock of going, well, we can't even determine if this guy was killed or not. Right. A lot of times I think these criminals think if there's no body, you can't have a conviction. And they would be right in most cases. We've we have seen cases, no body convictions is what they like to call them, a no body conviction. But on the grand scheme of things, when you look throughout the history of law and convictions in the United States, that's a relatively small percentage of the homicides in this country that that get a conviction with no body. If you're playing the percentages, you stand a better chance of not not being convicted. But also think about the problems that that creates just for the investigation to figure out. Yeah even who the suspect is or should be. And we don't know what he was going to do with the body parts. I mean, he could have mailed them out to people. This guy is the evil twin of Puka, not Hada. Yes. A a, a different version of another evil, evil guy. And the other strange thing here too, that's alarming. And this is another giant red flag. Remember red handed Supreme here. Right. (laughs) Burrito Supreme. Police very quickly obtain surveillance video of Sheldon Johnson entering the victim's apartment multiple times. So he, the victim lives on the sixth floor of this apartment building in the Bronx. Yeah. So what that means is Sheldon Johnson after the night that he killed him. So there's a period, there's a good period of time that goes by before he's actually caught red handed in the apartment later and arrested. He is seen on surveillance footage. They have at least one camera that's positioned on the sixth floor that shows Sheldon Johnson or someone that looks identical to Sheldon Johnson. Yeah. Going from the elevator into the victim's apartment and then coming out of the victim's apartment and going back into the elevator. And what he's doing is he's and you see in every little video and every picture there. Oftentimes he's arriving, getting off the elevator empty handed. And when he's leaving the apartment, now he's got a, he's got a, what appears to be a gift bag in one picture. He's got a trash bag in one picture. He's got something that he's carrying. It almost looks like a bowling ball bag in one picture. So he's slowly taking a couple pieces at a time and getting them from the sixth floor apartment hopping onto the elevator and then, and he's dressed different every single time. Some of the reporting says that it, in at least one of the videos, he appears to be wearing the victim's clothing, clothing that belonged to the victim. Right. And in one of the videos, a person who appears to be Sheldon Johnson looks like he's gone to great lengths to disguise himself. He's wearing like the, something over his face and a long blonde hair wig and it's actually a very freaky, scary looking image 
of him walking off of the elevator in this disguise. I mean, he's going to have to travel throughout the city and there's no more populated city, no more hustle and bustle than New York City. He's walking amongst the rest of us, carrying parts of his victim back to his own apartment. According to the FBI property crime data, most home break-ins happen in broad daylight. As the days get longer this spring, protect your home with Simply Safe, the award-winning home security system. Protect your property, protect yourself, but more importantly, protect your loved ones with Simply Safe. Simply Safe is so easy to use, so easy to set up, and you can check your property 24/7. Just name best home security systems of 2024 by U.S. News and World Report and recognized for the best customer service and home security by Newsweek. Both experts and customers love Simply Safe. This advanced technology protects every room, window, and door of your home, while cameras keep watch for suspicious activity 24-7. The system is backed by professional monitoring and less than a dollar a day. With live guard protection and smart alarm indoor camera, agents can actually talk to intruders in real time. You install the system your way. It's easy to do yourself, that's what we did, or you can get a professional to do it for you. Test it out with Simply Safe's 60 day risk free trial and return it for a full refund if not satisfied. We love Simply Safe. You're going to love Simply Safe. Protect your home today. My listeners, to get a special 20% off any new Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect monitoring, just visit simplysafe.com slash garage. That's simplysafe.com slash garage. There is no safe like Simply Safe. At the UPS store, we know things can get busy this upcoming holiday. You can count on us to be open and ready to help with any packing and shipping or anything else you might need. Is there anything you can't do? Um, actually, I don't have a good singing voice. <clears throat> the UPS. Nope. But our certified packing experts can pack and ship just about anything. At least that's good. The UPS Store. Be unstoppable. Most locations are independently owned. Product, services, pricing, and hours of operation may vary. See center for details. Come in today to get your holiday goodies there on time. Everyone loves a good family mystery, especially one with as many twists and turns as June's Journey, a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story. It takes you back to the glamour of the 1920s with a diverse cast of characters. You'll step into the role of June Parker, and search for hidden clues to uncover the mystery of her sister's murder. Use your observation skills to quickly uncover key pieces of information that lead to chapters of mystery, danger, and romance. And customize your very own luxurious estate island. Think expansive gardens and beautiful buildings. Collect scraps of information to fill your photo album and learn more about each character. And You can chat and play with or against other players by joining a detective club. Can you crack the case? Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. June needs your help, detective. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. All right, we are back. Cheers to you, mates. Cheers to the people in the back. Yeah, people in the back get, getting a lot of love. Yeah, you notice uh, this guy has more outfit changes than a Taylor Swift concert. I know. It, it reminded me of uh, Sarah Jessica Parker when we were kids when she hosted the MTV Music Awards. It's like every 15 minutes she she came out in a, in a different outfit that was even better than the one before. Yeah. So I'm looking at six different images of him leaving, arriving to the apartment or leaving the apartment. And all of them are clearly him. He's in different outfits, as you said. And we talked about the one disguise in particular, which is alarming. I'm guessing he he would have had to enter the building dressed normally and then put the disguise on in the elevator because there's no way he would have been able to walk throughout New York city 
dressed in that freaky outfit, the one with the long blonde hair and something strange blacking out his face. Yeah, and just like that, he was dressed like Sarah Jessica Parker. But that is the image, and that's the video that I first saw that drew this case to my attention and went, oh, this is strange. And the more I read about it, there's so many similarities to the Luca Magnata case. In one of those images, surveillance footage images, he's seen arriving to the apartment with that blue bin, that large blue bin that later they find the torso. And in some reports, they, they may have found a, an arm. Other reports say there, there's the torso in two feet. Were but in can there. you imagine at trial what's going to happen when he tries to deny that that's not my tub? Well, we have it on video you carrying the tub into the victim's apartment. We now yeah. have the victim in pieces dismembered and parts of his body are found in this blue tub that you brought. Yeah. So if I'm the prosecutor, the first question I'm asking, if he takes the stand and if he doesn't take the stand, the first question I'm going to throw out to the jury is I would really like to know, sir, did when you arrived with the blue bin, was the torso already in there or did it not get in there until you got into the apartment? Right. It, it, because it jump in there by itself. Yeah. yeah it, it, there is no defense for this guy as the way that I see it. Now, I guess where there's some mystery that's still involved, the, the way that this man was killed, 44 year old Colin small, the report is that he died from a single gunshot to the head. Makes sense. Execution style makes sense with the evidence is what I'm saying, because right. we have ear witnesses who are saying we heard somebody pleading for his life. Now, unfortunately, that's what you have here when someone's pulling off a murder execution style. What doesn't make a whole lot of sense is that those same ear witnesses, at least according to the reports, I don't want to muck anything up for the courts here. But according to the reports, it's two shots pleading for his life, followed by another two shots. But this man's only killed with a single shot to the head as what has been reported. So I'll give you a verbatim one report here specifically. The superintendent was called by a tenant who reported hearing two gunshots at around 1 a.m., after which she heard a man shouting, please don't I have family, end quote followed by another two shots. The superintendent checked the closed circuit TV footage on Colin Small's sixth floor, which captured a man later identified as Sheldon Johnson repeatedly exiting and entering the apartment in different clothes, including hats, a blonde wig, and the same outfit the victim had been wearing when he entered the apartment. They also found cleaning supplies, so they believe that he was also arriving with cleaning supplies along with that blue bin. And so this hazmat type suit, you can see how this is playing out. He killed the man. He's probably dismembering him in the bathtub. Oh God. Or shower would be my guess. Yeah. He's putting on this suit so he can dismember, make this large package smaller, one large package into many smaller packages, not to get a bunch of blood evidence all over his clothing, taking off that hazmat type suit, leaving in plain clothes with some of these small packages. Now, yeah. the, the reason where there is some mystery here is why the four shots, and maybe later we're going to find out that, that it wasn't just a single shot, but the tenant is reporting several shots. There's also a bit of a delay, as it sounds here, Captain, in the as far as the reporting goes, that the ear witness or ear witnesses heard this stuff. And then some time went by before it was reported to the super. Again, we already talked about the confusing part that it's called into the superintendent who then calls nine one one. I don't, I don't see any mystery in the superintendent in the delay of him calling nine one one, because as we know, he's saying, well, I went and I checked the surveillance footage and then called nine one one. There is a, a little bit of time that expires before police are at the scene. And then Sheldon Johnson is caught, as as you and I are saying, red-handed. 
apparently these two knew each other for a long period of time. And there's different reporting here again that some reports state that Colin Small and Sheldon Johnson were friends, were childhood friends. I can tell you on at least one day that they weren't friends. That was on uh, March 6th or March 7th. I mean, that's how new this information is. Other reports state that they were rivals. I don't know. I'm telling you, listening to the interview on Joe Rogan's show, look, Joe Rogan does a great job. As many listeners, it's a good podcast. He does not need us to spend 10 seconds to tell people to go listen to his show. I would love for him to spend 10 seconds telling his listeners to come listen to our show. Yeah, Joe. But that episode in particular, now, I, okay, I'm sitting here with the advantage of knowing what we know now when yeah. listening to that episode. And I'm trying very, uh, I'm giving it all my effort here, Captain, to not bring up the problems that I had with some of the statements made by Sheldon Johnson and Joe Rogan during the course of that two hour and 20 minute interview or whatever it was like, my God, man, that thing could have been 35 minutes and we would have walked away with the same information. But yeah, the first thing here is even had I not known what I know today, there was something Sheldon Johnson in that interview comes off as sounding very intelligent, very driven and all. And in a way I could see how he could inspire others to change or to grow as he claimed he did. Clearly, we know that he didn't change. Clearly, now we know that he didn't grow. Yeah. But there was something, there was always that little hint. There was always even, and I I kicked it aside and said, ignore what you know now. But there was something that didn't seem right. And I thought, you know what, I'm going I'm to have to do a little background check, a little research on this guy prior to the events of, of this month. Right. Remember in the interview, he spends a good deal of time talking about his sentence being unjust. It was an unfair sentence. What he was charged for, he should have been sentenced to 25 years, but he instead got charged and sentenced to 50 years. And I know what a lot of people were thinking immediately. Like, yes, I, I want to be clear here. Are there, is our justice system perfect? No, it's not. I would never say that. Is our prison system perfect? No, I would never say that. Is it as screwed up as Joe Rogan and Sheldon Johnson spent two and a half hours telling you that it is? Absolutely right. not. Absolutely not. But my first problem with the interview in itself is why are you going to have somebody that hasn't even spent a year out of prison? He got out, I believe, in May of 2023. Yes, I have no early problem. May of 2023. Look, it makes sense. If you want to talk about this subject with somebody that has some intelligence and can speak to it from the opposite side of the law, right? Somebody that's been through the system. Yeah. I talked to somebody that has been out of prison for 20 years, 10 years, five years, and has committed no other crime. There's a lot of people that they could have talked to, or he could even talk to individuals that they did a prison sentence and they weren't even guilty of the crime. Take like the Central Park Five, if you want to talk about this subject. But he had this person on. And I, look, there was no fault to Joe. It's not like Joe Rogan knew that this guy is going to go murder somebody and then dismember them. But Come on, the guy hasn't even been out for 365 days of not committing a crime. That's just somebody I would not want to talk to. Well, to expand on that and to burrito supreme this thing a little bit, Captain. So, yeah, where I do, I, I agree with you 100 percent on what you just said. I But I think and again, I'm kind of making an assumption here. My guess is that the actual guest is this Josh Dubin who I believe from the interview, my takeaway was that Joe has had him on multiple times and he is the, he's spearheading this uh, fight wrongful convictions, create reform and, and, and resources for these persons to work themselves back into society 
and that he's been on the show many times and that, that he often brings a guest along with him. Right. So I guess in Joe's defense, I don't know 100% how much Joe knew it, about the, the tag along guest, which would be Sheldon Johnson. And right. Josh Dubin does, and the reason why I say that I know that Josh Dubin has been on the show before, I've listened to the show a handful of times. It's a good show, but I don't, I'm not listening to the show enough to have heard Josh Dubin on there before, but he starts off the interview saying, look, Joe, usually I bring somebody with me that's been wrongly, for, wrongly convicted. Today, I brought somebody with me who, who was guilty, and but this is a different experience, and we can talk about this, and there's a lot of information. There's a lot that America can learn here. Where I would fault Joe Rogan and his team is maybe vet the guy, even if it's after the fact, because some of the stuff that Sheldon Johnson was saying on the show just isn't true. You know, he's saying I was unjustly, unfairly sentenced to 50 years when I should have only been sentenced to 25. And when you hear an African-American male saying this, of course, sorry. If I'm being small minded here, but I jumped to the idea, well, did a bunch of white people unjustly sentence him to 50 years when it should be 25? And right. then I find out, no, that the judge was African American. I hear Sheldon Johnson saying, well, I was, I was charged for an assault. I, I had a gun at the time of the assault. I robbed a guy with a gun. The guy owed me money. His claim is I gave this guy on consignment, I fronted him a bunch of drugs. I got picked up, jammed up for something else, something small time. And this guy probably got it in his head. Well, he doesn't have to pay me back once he sells those drugs. He can just go out and spend the money because yeah. Sheldon got jammed up. Well, Sheldon gets out and he tracks him down. Where's my money? I don't have your money. I spent it. Oh, so now he's going to rob the dude. Rob, robs him at gunpoint. And according to Sheldon Johnson's story, as he tells it on the Rogan podcast, he hits the dude with the gun. The, this is his words. Hits the dude with the gun. I got 50 years. He got two stitches. Yeah. Let's examine this a little bit further. I found several reputable news sources reporting on that story back when he was arrested and convicted of that situation that Sheldon Johnson explained to us in his version of the story. The real version of the story is he shot at the man. He shot the man in the back like a coward. And he was actually charged with not assault. And he wasn't just convicted of assault. He was convicted of attempted murder. Right. This man is running from him. He shoots him in the back. So if he got two stitches, that could that could be the truth. But those two stitches were stitching up a wound that, for all we know, very likely Sheldon Johnson's intent was to fatally harm this man, to shoot him, to kill him. If you're shot in the back, I don't care where it is on the back, unless you're 15 foot tall, that bullet is about six inches to 12 inches away from, from killing you. Anywhere yeah. head, could be the head, could be the heart, could be the lungs. Lower admin's a horrible place to be shot at, to be, to be shot as well. Most of those people bleed out and that's not a way, to, that's no way to go. Right. So he wants to spin it and tell us that, oh, I got 50 years because I hit this dude with a gun. Yeah. You hit the dude with the gun. You hit him with a bullet from the gun. Well, and the main reason why he got 50 and not 25 is after he shot the guy, he yelled bazinga. Well, the, the other problem I had with some things he was saying on there was he was saying, look, the system oh, is set he's up. He's a real piece of shit is what this guy is. He's a cowardly piece of shit. And the thing that I didn't like what he said was he even said, let me try to be good for a while. And if that doesn't work out, I can just always go back to doing bad shit. Well, he had said that, you know, part of the, the system that's flawed is that you get picked up and you get a slap on the wrist, right? You get, you get, get a small charge, you get a small punishment. But what he says, the problem is, is that the problem is that these guys, these young guys and other people don't know you get picked up on something there. This is building a paper trail against you. So 
when you get picked up again and again and again, eventually you can get 20, 25 years for a simple assault. And he says, this is entrapment. And I say, no, Sheldon Johnson, that's called a second chance. It's called a third chance. Yeah. Yeah. You, he's right. You get picked up on a small charge, you get a small punishment and he's right. You could get 20 years on a simple assault, but guess who gets 20 years on a simple assault charge? Someone who has assaulted and assaulted and assaulted and reoffended and reoffended again and again and again. And that's who Sheldon Johnson was. So when we sit here and have to listen to him say that he was unjustly sentenced, that it was an unfair sentence of 50 years, guess who got it right? The judge has sentenced him to 50 years because if he had to spend all that 50 years in prison, Colin Small might still be alive. That's my big issue when people want to complain about sentences. Well, they sentenced me for 50 years, but you didn't serve it. And that's one of my big problems. And I think one of the big flaws, if you get 10 years, you serve 10 years, period. Oh, you were on your best behavior. Who gives a shit? If you're not on your best behavior, we're going to give you extra time. That's how it should work. I mean, if your kid is acting up and you say, hey, Sheldon, go to your room. And he goes to his room and he starts blasting music and yelling curse words and whatever. You go into his room and go, hey, you're going to knock it off. And if you want to keep acting this way, you're going to spend longer. And and how many cases have we covered where somebody got 15, 20 years for rape or whatever they were charged with and they let them out in five years or six years and then they went on to rape more people or to start killing people? Like maybe that's one of the ways we could fix the system is what you're charged with is what you get. And I don't understand that, again, I just don't understand this notion of if you behave, we'll give you less time. Nope. If you behave, you're going to do the time that you were sentenced for. If you don't behave, we're going to give you more time. Well, and that's that's the other part of it where where I want to go, hey, uh, Mr. Johnson, rather than going on and on about this unfair sentence of 50 years, it the sentence of 50 years doesn't mean anything when you serve 24 of that. When, it, when, when you're, when you, I hear you telling me that the maximum I was supposed to be sentenced to is 25 years. Well, guess what? That's what you served. I don't understand well, yeah, what you're complaining you about. Like, 24. It, but if he was sentenced 25, he should have, se- he should have served 25. What he's really may, trying maybe to say. Maybe he did serve 25. I, I don't know, but it was, right, it right. was roughly that. Yeah. You know, some reports say 24, some say 25, he probably got some time served for while he was waiting for this thing to go to trial. Right. Then the on and on talk about being from a multi-generational family that, that is, has all gone to prison. You know, the, the, his father went to prison, his son went to prison, his son attacked a a 24 year old college student for no reason. They, they didn't know each other. He picked a guy at random on the street and, and, and started beating him up And that, that man tried to run from Sheldon's son, ran out into the street and got hit by a car and got killed. Sheldon Johnson's son got 10 months, got 10 months for that one. Sheldon Johnson's father, Sheldon Johnson's father raped on more than one occasion, his seven-year-old stepdaughter. Um, so I, I look, there is evidence to suggest that a person coming up, that a young Sheldon would have a more difficult time coming up if, if his father's in prison, if he's raised for a portion of his childhood without a father. But when we're, when we're really trying to look and examine it at all of this stuff, this, this is what angers me. And why do we so quickly get away from the root of the problem, the root of the cause, the root of the solution? Right. It's not fair to say that there is evidence to suggest that somebody is more likely to offend and commit crimes and end up in prison because their father was in prison. You know why it's not fair? Because why isn't the argument, it's more likely that the child will end up in prison, 
not because his father was in prison, but because his father was a piece of shit who was a rapist who broke the law multiple times. And that, and that he had, that this child had to spend time with that person. Right. This child was raised by that por- person for at least a per- portion of their life. I'd rather them not be there to influence a young Sheldon. Well, and I always tell people when we talk about parenting and, and things of that nature, I always say, I, I believe kids learn more from seeing your behaviors than they're going to learn from you saying, do this or do that. So you want your kid to read? Well, just read around them and they'll see this behavior and then they'll go, oh, well, maybe I should read. If if I'm going out and committing crimes, the person goes, well, maybe I could do that. Well, I got good news for you, Captain. I have a book recommendation for you at the end of today's show. But the, the other thing that angers me, and I and I want to I want to jump off of this here in a little bit because I'm getting worked up and uh uh-huh. Maybe circle back to the story a little bit. It's time for you to eat a burrito and maybe an enchilada. Yeah, and maybe a quaalude so I can calm down. (laughs) Don't do that. It's illegal. The other thing here, too, is they spent a good deal of time talking about how many inmates this country has. And look, there's no getting around it. I'm not trying to put, I'm not trying to make a great argument for, oh, I love the prison system. I'm not trying to say that at all. What I'm trying to point out is that a lot of these problems that are discussed and brought up constantly are not such a big problem. Okay. Yes. At one time, did we have the highest percentage of inmates population in, out of any country in the world? Yeah, we did. This country is a young country and it's had a violent history. We, we came in and and revolted f- against the persons that th- that we fled from we a large portion of our history is cowboys in the wild west we're not too many generations removed from that but guess what today we don't have the highest percentage so are we starting to correct if you think that's a huge problem i don't if you think it's a huge problem maybe pump the brakes a little bit because we've worked to correct that we're, we're slowly moving down that list. And here's one thing I want to point out. Like, so they discussed that the, the prison population and they're going off of 2023 numbers because we're early in 2024, 1.9 million people are currently incarcerated in the United States. Joe Rogan's response is, God, the system is so fucked up. Hey, brilliant analysis there, Joe. That's some real in de- yeah. in-depth thinking. Why don't we pump the brakes a little bit and, and, and look at the picture, the whole picture? 1.1 million people are currently incarcerated in this country. This is a country with a population of 330 million people. That's not even 1% of, not even 1% of our population yeah. is in prison. And look, 109, 1.9 million people in prison. If that's a problem, fine. But can we examine this as it should be examined? If I took, you would have to get up to, look, my, I, I didn't go to MIT or anything, but my, my math would tell me that you got to get up to 300 and about 45, 46 million people to get this number to be 2 million people. If you're going to, you know, put together the math and the, the percentages to get this number to be 2 million people. So let's pretend that it's 2 million people. Let's play with some, some easy math here. That does not seem like a problem to me. Think about this equation. Let's take 330 people, or if we want the math to be correct, 345 people. Let's put them on an island and then let's introduce things that are natural, well, natural or unnatural or undesired behaviors and influences and variables, but that actually exist in the real world. Yeah. Because we're not bean counters. These aren't just numbers. These are people in real living situations that we're discussing here. Let's put 345 people on an island and then let's introduce money, drugs, Sex, 
guns, greed, perversion, and the list goes on and on. I would be surprised if you're only kicking two people off of the island because that's all prison is. We've decided, guess what? That jerk and that asshole, they're too terrible. They're too violent. They're a menace to society. They cannot live in our society. They cannot live on our island. We voted them off. Right. Send them to Australia. I'm telling you, man, if if you would be surprised at how well behaved and how good that system appears when you look at it from that angle. They're kicking off more than two people from that island. I'm telling you right now. In fairness to Joe Rogan, though, his show is live. And I think sometimes you could say something like, oh, man, that's a lot of people or, wow, man, the system's so messed up. And then he might, you know, an hour later go, well, actually, when you do the math. It, yeah, it could just be a knee jerk reaction. Didn't have a chance to think it out. Um, yeah, I mean, I've talked, you know, politics or cases. People come up and say, you know, Scott Peterson, I, I think he's innocent. And this is why X, Y, Z. And you. And in the moment, you're just kind of going, well, that's interesting. And I don't agree with anything that they were telling me. But uh, so I, I, I would, I'd want to have the benefit of the doubt. So I'll give Joe Rogan the benefit of the doubt. But. And, and that's fair. And that's right to do because, and I, I'm sorry, and I will do so as well, because it's not easy to talk with a microphone in front of your face. Anybody that thinks that it is, I, I would suggest maybe give it a shot. Look, the captain has told me, Colonel, I can tolerate you as long as you say less than dumb, less than three dumb things an episode. And right. every time when we hit the stop button, he goes, well, you met your quota again this week. Um, so, yeah. it, you know, Episode's it's not over. easy. And I, and I certainly say some dumb things and probably said a few things uh, that are dumb today. And as you pointed out, Joe Rogan's show is live. Uh, I, I would imagine there's some editing involved, but his show's live. I'm maybe after this episode, he'll want our show to be dead. No, Joe Rogan's a big fan of people from Columbus, Ohio. Well, here's okay. So here's some other suspicions and some things that I want in the things that will need to get sorted out. So Colin small, while he at times in his life has not has not been in, an angel as well. I mean, he ended up in prison for a long period of time as well. Yeah, but um, he, didn't but he however, this and his family no, don't deserve this. No, absolutely this. not. And, and 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 look, he might have actually changed his ways. He might have yeah. actually grown up and changed his ways. Where what we have the flip side of that coin is a Sheldon Johnson Jr., age forty eight who clearly has not changed his ways. All he did yeah. was repackage his bad self and he sold us his, the new Sheldon Johnson, which was a lie. It all was a lie. Bazinga. And so some reports that they're old childhood friends, other reports are that they were rivals. We do know that Sheldon Johnson was what he says was a high ranking member of the bloods. And that he walked while in prison, he walked away from the gang life. I, it, it looks, I actually believe that he probably never did. He just convinced the rest of us that he did. Well, and he said, he told everybody on the show, well, I was going to try to be good for a while. And then if I can't do that, I'll just go back to being bad. That's, that is a person that's a pile of shit. It's not that hard to be good. It's not that hard to live a life of kindness to try to treat other people the way you want to be treated. I mean, there's so many simple rules that if this country would just start following them, it'd be a way better place. Just treat people how you would want to be treated. Show people a level of respect. Stop being such fragile men. The best way to determine and expect what could be future behavior is looking at past behavior and what did Sheldon Johnson do in the past? He got locked up for something small, got a short little time in jail and by his own words, his own admission, he tells us I got out and then I went after the people that I fronted drugs to, or that did something to me before I went in because they thought that I'd never, they thought that I got jammed up and I wouldn't come after them. That's what he did. He, and he, according to his interview, he says he, he did that not on one occasion when he, 
hit the guy with the gun, which we now know means shot him in the back. He did that on multiple occasions, according to his interview. And yeah. now let's cross examine that or, or examine that thought with the idea of what we're being told that Colin small him and they've known each other since childhood, whether they were friends or rivals. It's hard to say it's been reported both ways. Both served lengthy prison sentences. Were they rivals or friends in prison? Were they both at Sing Sing at the same time? Did he get out and then decide to go after this guy who may have changed his ways? Who, who the, Colin Small was out for years, several years before he was killed by Sheldon Johnson. Right. So we talk about past behavior that suggests to me, maybe he did actually change his ways. Unlike Sheldon Johnson, who gave Sheldon Johnson a gun. That's the other mystery that we need to figure out here, because regardless of him being out, being paroled, he's not allowed to have a gun. I don't think Sheldon is that concerned with following laws, but have fun with flags in prison. You pile of shit. He tells us in the interview that he's, uh, an authoritarian that he likes rules that he's a big rule guy well turns out no 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 you're not sheldon you, he also likes you to might, lie yeah you're a big liar is what you are why is what we need to sort out now and i'm sure that i'm sure the nypd they're a good outfit they'll figure this thing out the the detectives that they showed in the arresting photos of sheldon johnson and from from what little words they have said to the media, they appear to be on top of it. I have a lot of confidence that they're going to get this thing right. It helps that, yeah, red flag supreme here with this guy, red handed supreme. And I I think that they'll make short work of Sheldon Johnson. He he thought his last sentence was unjustified with fifty years instead of twenty five. He only served twenty five from everything we're being told. It, it doesn't matter what the words are, right? It really matters the time. And it turns out that, that it all equaled out in the end. And unfortunately, he hit the streets again, and he showed us his real true colors. And it's a shame because when I heard the interview, I thought, this guy sounds like somebody who's very capable of doing some good things. And the persons that he was talking with, Joe Rogan and... Josh Dubin, two persons that are not only capable of doing good things, but have done good things. Yeah. Have done a lot of good things. It's, it's just a shame because you hear something like this. And while I did not agree with everything that they were saying, while I did not agree with everything that they were, that they were picking apart and had a problem with, I liked to hear the discussion taking the, the at least we're having the discussion and at least it's in a, a, in a forum and on a platform that thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people could hear it. Well, no. And I think it's a good way to live life. If you start thinking, if we could just change 1%, get 1% better every day. If I can just treat people a little bit better than I treated people yesterday. If we can get the prison system just 1% better every day, if we could get Washington, just 1% better every day. Where would this country be at? Where would we be at as, as a race, a human race? So we're all capable of it, and we're also all capable of more. But like you said, I, I totally agree. It, it does start with having a conversation because you need to take a good look of where you're at and where you want to get to and what steps you have to take to get there. And this guy was given, you know, he complained that there's no resources, there's no breaks to these people when they get out, which, again, it's hard to take him at his word because we know he's a liar. And number two, he right after saying, look, there, there was no resources for when these guys get out. And then he shouts out five, six people, organizations that helped him when he got out. So right. both can't be true. But what what's a shame here and very disappointing is, is Colin Small lost his life. He, he pled and begged for his life. This man showed him no mercy, didn't even have the human decency to to spare his life. Didn't didn't have this man is evil. 
He deserved every minute of that 50 years that he was sentenced to. I'm confident he will never get out again. He will never have the opportunity to reoffend outside the walls of a prison. But beyond the loss of life here, it's really a shame that people like the Queen's Defenders, who he worked for, who's an organization that I'm sure is doing great work for those persons that he shouted out and organizations that he gave a shout out to for helping him when he got out. They're doing good work too. And it's not easy work because a lot of times doors just don't open up for these organizations that want to represent convicted persons, felons, convicts, doors don't just Most of the time, they don't just open up. They got to do a lot of work and a lot of effort, and they got to show. They got to show that this is a good thing, that we are doing good work to earn the, the, the credibility and the respect of funding and, and where that funding comes from. And Sheldon Johnson may have taken a big, huge, you know, one giant step for man, one big leap for mankind or whatever that, that saying is, this is a giant leap backwards for those organizations. With, with somebody who was, in ways, the face of some of those, those groups. And so while he, this guy got every advantage, he got all these people helping him and working for him and helping him to get out and become a free man. And this is what he did with that freedom. You could be anywhere in the world and you're here with us and we want to thank you. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful listeners? Yes, of course we do, Captain. This week we are recommending In the Belly of the Beast by Jack Henry Abbott. It was funny when I was listening to the Joe Rogan podcast interview with Sheldon Johnson. I kept thinking about this book and then at some point this book is actually brought up during their conversation. This book is truly like, it's like the prequel to what we are talking to, talking about today. So Jack Henry Abbott, the author, was in prison when he wrote the book. And the book consists of letters that he wrote to Norman Mailer about his experiences in what Abbott was calling a brutal and unjust prison system. Abbott gets paroled in 1981, the same year that In the Belly of the Beast was published. The book was very successful, but that same year, shortly after his release, Jack Henry Abbott kills Richard Adden during a dispute at a restaurant in the East Village of New York City. He is arrested, convicted, and ever so quickly finds himself back in prison, this time for the rest of his life. Check out In the Belly of the Beast. You can find that great recommendation, along with many other great recommendations, on our recommended page, truecrimegarage.com. And when you're checking out the website, make sure you sign up on the mailing list. Until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter.